Hello, everybody. Welcome to a new episode of The Dissenter. I'm your host, as always, Ricardo Lopes, and today I'm joined by Dr. Zoe Lieberman. She is an associate professor of psychology at the University of California, Santa Barbara. She investigates the origins and development of human social cognition. She is particularly interested in how infants begin to understand our complicated social world, as well as how these understanding changes across development and is shaped by experience. And today we're going to talk a little bit about that. So Dr. Lieberman, welcome to the show. It's a pleasure to have you on. Thanks so much for having me. I'm really excited to be here. Great. So let's start perhaps with, uh, I, I'm not sure if it's a basic question, but perhaps the first question I would like to ask you, um, do we have any idea when exactly children start to get socialized? I think that children are socialized basically as soon as possible, as soon as they're mm -hmm. born. I and mean, some socialization is more explicit and that might happen later. So for example, like this is how we do this, a parent or other community member directly um, teaching a child. But there's also a lot of implicit socialization that's happening as soon as uh, babies are born where they're looking around seeing, oh, how is it that people are doing things and uh, noticing different kinds of similarities across what's happening um, and also differences. So uh, in terms of who they interact with and how those people interact with them. So I think that those kinds of processes are happening as as early as possible. Mm -hmm. And when children want to learn more about specific individuals, do they take into account social relationships? Yes, I think that when babies are born, you know, human infants, unlike a lot of other animals, are completely reliant on their caregivers. So across you know, different species, there's massive variability in this from some species that are just, they don't have any parental investment at all. That, you know, they just, the eggs are laid, babies are born, they go and do their thing. Um, and humans are on the complete other end of the spectrum where uh, even in terms of things like very simple motor development, babies can't, uh, you know, lift their heads yet when they're newborns. And people even call the first three months of life sometimes the fourth trimester, like really they probably still wish they were um, inside. And so um, because it, human infants are so reliant on caregivers, it seems to be a very important task for them to figure out who's going to provide help and how could they, you know, um, keep themselves alive pretty much. And so, um, you know, they might emit social signals like crying or smiling in order to try to change their environment and get the kinds of things that they need. So this doesn't have to be incredibly conscious, right? I'm not saying that there's some series of language going on in a newborn's mind, like, ah, if I cry, then my mom will feed me. Um, but throughout human evolution, those kinds of pairings have have happened such that such certain behaviors are more likely to lead to certain actions and then those things get reinforced and so i think babies are born with this need for social partners and then have to figure out basically well which ones are the relevant social partners and some of that is relatively easier you know based on familiarity like oh when I cry, most of the time, one of these two people, my primary caregivers, is the one who responds. Um, but there's also kind of really recent research that's been coming out that shows that babies are able to then track the relationships of those people. So, you know, oh, I know that I have a relationship with my mom. And if I see that my mom has a relationship with this person, then maybe that person's a good social partner for me, too. Um, and so I think that that's uh, one piece of evidence that's a more part of a more general phenomenon of basically trying to figure out which people are kind of in my social network and in my social group and that babies are kind of tasked with that, even if it's relatively more implicit uh, from the first months of life. Uh, and how do children know who knows what? I mean, if they want to get any particular piece of information, uh, how do they know who they should approach? So children need to learn 
basically everything. So a lot of different kinds of things and different people might have different kinds of knowledge. And so in one study that I did, I was very interested um, in looking at how children use relationships to figure out who knows what. And in particular, whether they think that people who they share different kinds of relationships with know different things. Um, and so in this study, we compared uh, people who were friends, people who were group mates, and uh, people who were siblings. And we found that kids from a pretty early age understand that these different types of people will know different kinds of things. So they expect, expect friends, for example, to know each other's secrets. Friendship is a dyadic relationship that's based on a lot of interpersonal connection. And so, um, you know, you're more likely to have those intimate moments where you might do something like share a secret with somebody. Um, on the other hand, there's a lot of people who might be in your social group, like your cultural community, um, who would have relevant cultural knowledge, but you might not know them as well. Like if there's a leadership in your religious organization or something like that, you might not share your, your personal secrets with them. That might depend on the norms of the religion in question, um, but you might expect them to know, you know, how to celebrate a novel holiday or how to make cultural foods or how to sing cultural songs. And so children do make this distinction too. They expect people from the same cultural group to share cultural knowledge, um, but not necessarily to share that kind of intimate knowledge. And I think that siblings were a really interesting case because they share some properties with both of these types of relationships. So just like friends, there's a lot of this interpersonal dyadic connection um, within a family, but also because they are in the same family, siblings are likely to be members of the same cultural group, cultural community. And so children did uh, infer that they, you know, had um, some of these, both of these types of shared knowledge. And uh, we also asked children about another type of knowledge, which was moral knowledge. Uh, we predicted that children might think that everyone should know that. So if there is just some kind of general nature, like, oh, hitting is wrong, then you might expect that to be something that's shared across people, regardless of their relationship. Um, interestingly, we found that children did think that friends should know that hitting is wrong. Um, also, groupmates should know that hitting is wrong. Uh, they were slightly more at chance when we asked about siblings. And we think that that, you know, could be just because of their own um, experiences in these uh, sibling relationships where probably siblings do get into fights. So um, it'd be interesting in the future to ask about other types of moral knowledge that might not have that same compound for the sibling case. But in general, it seems like as early as about kindergarten, children are thinking about relationships as guiding the types of knowledge that people will have. And they think that people in different relationships will share different types of knowledge. So they're not kind of defaulting to a mere like closeness heuristic, like, oh, people who are close are going to be more similar to each other and people who are distant will be further. So um, instead, it seems more selective than that. And how do children learn to distinguish between in groups and out groups and uh, what kinds of cues do they pay attention to? Yeah, so I think that, you know, across different cultures, there are different types of groups that are relevant to children's life. And just like learning which um, social partners are going to be the ones that help you, I think children are learning what are the social divisions in my world that my community cares about. And so in social psychology, there's been a huge literature on social categorization, which is the process of dividing the world into social groups that is focused mainly on like the big three and um, those categories being gender. So male and female, race um, and age. And in, there's a, a big literature on these types of categories and the idea that they're somewhat automatically encoded. And I think a lot of people have some experience feeling that way like um, for example if you moved into a new apartment building and you were getting your mail from the mailbox and somebody was next to you who you had never met before and then you go upstairs and you tell your significant other or partner like oh there was a person getting the mail the types of things that you might recall about them are something like oh it was like uh you know an older hispanic woman or something like that like that we have this you know, without getting that much interaction, we seem to like just encode those types of things about people. 
And so I think some people, you know, would say like, oh, well, maybe there's a reason that we kind of attend to those categories and maybe young children even would attend to those same categories. Like there's something about um, them that's relevant. And in some cases, I think that this might be true. So one of the um, methods that people have used to look at social categorization is basically um, kind of mistaken memories. So like if you see a lot of people and they're each associated with saying something or in a kid version, seeing something like, oh, these kids all went to the zoo. You know, this kid saw a giraffe. This kid saw um, an elephant. This kid saw whatever. Um, then you can ask uh, participants who are children later, like, oh, what did this kid see? And they make a lot of mistakes. It's hard to do these kinds of tasks, um, but they're more likely to make mistakes that are within the same category. So like misremembering that a different girl saw um, an elephant rather than misremembering that it was actually seen by a boy. Um, so that kind of suggests that they did encode that category of gender. But interestingly, children don't seem to actually have the same kind of encoding process for race. So they're um, equally likely to make errors within a racial category and across. And you can also see these same kinds of findings when you ask about more like the early development of bias. So preferences for people in your own group. So um, even three year olds, for example, if you ask them like, oh, do you want to play with this boy or this girl are relatively likely to choose the same gender playmate um, and to play with things that other people of their gender are playing with. But if you ask them like, oh, who do you want to play with? Like, for example, a white child in the United States, this white child, or this black child, they're at chance and they're equally willing to play with these two children. Um, racial preferences and bias, of course, does develop, but just not as early in life as some attention to something like gender. Um, a different category that really young children and even infants appear to be highly attentive to is language and accent. And it's possible that these are really uh, robust markers of cultural group and difficult to fake. We learn the language of our native communities and we learn language as children. And if you try to learn a language as an adult, you'll know that that's very difficult. Um, and that for the most part, if you don't learn a language by puberty, you'll never quite sound exactly native. So you can be fluent and have a really great vocabulary, but you won't necessarily sound um, like indistinguishable from a native speaker. And so language can be a really uh, robust, reliable and honest marker of cultural group. And it seems like uh, even infants are ready to pay attention to that and show preferences for interacting with people who speak, uh, you know, the languages in their communities. Mm -hmm. And what kinds of ex ex sorry, expectations do children develop uh, when it comes to the moral behavior of in-groups and out-groups? Yeah, so, you know, I think that this is a, a very interesting question uh, about these moral expectations. In one study, my collaborators and I introduced uh, children to pairs of people, and those people varied in terms of their group membership. And we used language for the reasons I was just uh, discussing. So we showed kids basically two people. One of them um, spoke English with a native accent. These were kids tested in the United States. And the other one spoke French, um, with, you know, in a fluent French. Um, and then we asked children basically, okay, uh, who of these two characters did blank? And that blank could be a variety of things. Some of the things that we asked about were conventions. So things that you learn within your cultural community and your society. So something like which one of these people waited in line. And for that, um, even, you know, kids that were four and five years old were more likely to pick the member of their community, the native English speaker. We also asked questions that were more about like morality. So which one of these two people broke a toy? Um, and for that kind of question, the younger children were at chance in how they answered. They didn't have these expectations that group membership would have an impact on morality, maybe because they thought, well, like no one should break this toy. 
Um, but older kids around nine and 10 were more likely to pick the French speaker, in that case, the outgroup member, suggesting that at least in these kind of forced choice tasks, if I had to say that somebody did this immoral thing, I'm gonna be more likely to pin that on, you know, the person that's not in my group. Right. Uh, so when it comes to social categorization, you've talked there about things like gender, race, age. Are there other social categories that children learn to pay attention to? So I think that children are basically ready to pick up on what the categories that people in their community care about are. And so in our communities, a lot of times the things that you list are what it looks like people care about. I also mentioned language a little bit, but there can be other things that are made to seem relevant or that people care about. Um, in some cultures, you know, religion is a really stark divide. And so then you would get a lot more, uh, you know, social categorization by religion than in cultures where people don't care about that. Um, so those are some big ones, but I think that there's been uh, interesting research in psychology that you can make any kind of grouping feel more more relevant and then people will start to attend to it. So there's a huge body of literature on even things like minimal groups, which are randomly assigned. So you tell people, oh, you're an overestimator or you're an underestimator. And then people start to develop preferences for pe other people in their own group, even though the groupings are very arbitrary. Um, there's research that children will do this too if you assign them to like blue groups or yellow groups and then use the groups functionally in the classroom like okay the blue kids are going to do you know math now and the yellow kids are going to do um, whatever else it is uh, reading then they'll start to develop preferences for people in in their own group and so um you know, I think there's a question of why societies have in general maybe cared about certain kinds of grouping and whether that would happen across all human societies or um, or whether like we could in certain situations have different kinds of structures and that would lead to different sets of things being what was more relevant. So for example, one thing that I'm very interested in is that there seems to be this early native language bias, um, but a lot of that research comes from families in the United States, and the United States is particularly um, monolingual, unlike a lot, uh, that's changing, but it still is mostly the case, um, but the vast majority of of the world is not monolingual, and so um, what would it mean to you know, live in a community where language maybe wasn't the same exact kind of divide, or would you be less biased towards people who sound like you if you were exposed to multiple languages? Um, on the one hand, you know, it's possible you would just create a different kind of group. So if you're bilingual in English and Spanish, maybe you would like English speakers and Spanish speakers more than Japanese speakers. Um, but it could be that it could create more openness um, than that. But we don't know yet. But anyway, it's certainly not the case that just because in a particular society and specifically among children, we find them paying attention to certain social categories that uh, these categories ne are necessarily innate, right? I mean, they can be acquired, acquired through culture. I think that a lot of this has to do with culture. I think for sure you can see that in terms of things like racial categorization, the amount to which children attend to that at all varies dramatically across um, different cultures and across based on things like whether race is a marker of status in their communities. And so it seems like it would not be inevitable that we develop this kind of bias. But if you're living in a kind of community that is structured in a way that has these biases, then it's easy for kids to pick up on them. It's possible some of these things are relatively more likely to pop up across all cultures. And therefore, I mean, I think there's a question of what the word innate even means. But throughout human history, there's been a gender division of labor. And so, you know, that category might be something that is more attended to universally, um, regard like even in vastly different cultures as assuming that there is any um, maintenance of gendered um, division of labor, which in terms of things like childcare, 
in the vast majority of places there there is. Mm -hmm. So how do children determine that someone is friends with them or not? What are the cues they pay attention to when it comes to this issue? Yeah, kids are paying attention to all sorts of cues when they're trying to decide who's friends. And a lot of the cues that they're paying attention to are really the same ones that we as adults care about. And I think a lot of uh, the research that I've done on this uh, area with Alex Shaw, who's at University of Chicago, has shown that kids are in a lot of ways much more sophisticated than, um, you know, people might have thought. So the types of things that they're paying attention to are, you know, who's spending time together. Um, but when they're doing that, they're not just thinking about the actual amount of time, they're thinking about the intentions behind that. So if you compare, you know, oh, these two people spend a lot of time together because their teacher randomly assigned them to sit next to each other in class versus these two people spend a lot of time together um, because they chose to and they like to. Um, kids know that, you know, in this case, that time spent together is a good indicator of friendship, but in this case, less so. Um, or, you know, it, other kinds of cues that we've found that children use are um, things like sharing. So if I, you know, give something to you, that could be a good indicator that I like you. Um, but it's not just that I gave something to you, right? It matters, like, what's the whole uh, connection between all of the different people? So if I give one thing to you, but I give two things to this person, then me giving you that wasn't actually a good cue that I liked you. I instead was, you know, showed partiality towards this other person. And so I probably liked them more. Um, in this case too, uh, at least by about six, kids are relatively more advanced even than that. If I happened to give this person more because I spun a wheel and it, it made me give them more, then that's no longer a good indication of friendship. So kids are really thinking a lot about intentions um, when they're deciding how to interpret these same types of behaviors. And what about similarity? Is that something that children, children pay attention to? Yes, uh, children also pay attention to similarities. Some of the kinds of similarities that they care about are these same kinds of social group markers that we talked about before. So like gender. So um, kids, you know, in addition to choosing friends for themselves that are of their same gender, they expect that if two other kids are the same gender, they'll be more likely to be friends. They also care about similarity in terms of things like preferences uh, for foods and toys. In some of the studies we've looked at, um, so kids seem to care about all of those types of cues, you know, um, similarity, sharing, spending time together. We've also done studies with loyalty. Um, so like, who do I back in an argument or who, if I only have, you know, one thing, who, who do I help? Um, so kids seem to care about all of these cues, and we've done studies where we kind of pit them against each other to try to determine the hierarchy of which ones are, are most important um, and found that, you know, young kids are less discriminate. They tend to, you know, think of all of these things as relatively important, um, but older kids will start to think about things like loyalty um, as relatively more important than something like similarity, even though they still, um, you know, Know, if they if similarity is the only thing they have to go on, uh, they still will will use that. Uh, and what about secret sharing? I mean, with whom do children share their secrets? Or I mean, do they expect some people to share their secrets with them or not? Yeah, so I mentioned that one cue of friendship is basically sharing, right? So if I give you something, like that might mean that I like you. Um, kids also think that you, the thing that you share doesn't have to be um, a physical item. Mm. It can instead be actually information. And this is a much more abstract type of concept. So it's maybe not that surprising that a young child would think, oh, if somebody gives me a cookie, they like me, right? Or if I give somebody a cookie, it might, you know, make we could maybe be friends or something like that because kids like cookies. Um, but something like a secret is seemingly more complicated to understand. Like there's no physical item there. You have to know like, oh, I probably shouldn't tell anyone else this. Like this is something for just us. And we found that by around age five, uh, children do think that sharing a secret is a very good cue to friendship. So if I that 
they think that people will share their secrets selectively with their friends but not everything. So if I won an award, they think that I could tell everybody that. So they understand that there's different types of information in the world and that we share these types of information for different reasons. And we trust our friends with our secrets more than we would um, you know, trust other people. Um, and interestingly, children, when you do these kinds of experiments where you pit different features of friendship against each other, children think that sharing information like a personal secret is more indicative of friendship than sharing an item like a cookie. So that I think is pretty fascinating because, you know, and I think it's what an adult would think too, the secret stay, stays with you, whereas the cookie um, goes away and the secret implies a lot of trust and intimacy. Um, in one study we did, we actually told children that, you know, somebody told another person a secret and then that person either shared it further or kept it to themselves when asked. And um, kids around these same ages, like around six years old or, you know, these kindergarten type years, understand that if this person shares the secret, that's going to ruin the friendship they had with the person who told them. So they they know that there's some relational consequences about uh, secret sharing, which uh, seems pretty abstract. Mm -hmm. And how do children think about and evaluate relationships between people who either have similar or shared or opposed evaluations? Yeah, so one type of uh, similarity that it seems like kids and even babies care about is how you evaluate items. And so basically in a series of studies we've shown um, as young as six months of age and also at, at nine months and 14 months, um, little videos where basically there's two actors in the videos and they have two bowls of food in front of them. And one of the actors pulls a bowl of food towards herself and eats it and, and likes it saying, ooh, I like that. And then the second actor, you know, eats the foods and she either can agree and like the same food um, or she can disagree and think that food is gross. So saying something like, ew, I don't like that. You know, they're babies, so unclear that they understand the language. So we use these differences in tone um, and facial expression. And so after showing them the preferences or evaluations of these two different people, um, infants watch the two people uh, interact positively like their friends by smiling and waving at each other so saying like hi um, or they interact negatively like they're not friends so they look at each other but then they turn away and go <laughs> like they don't like each other um, and basically what we do is that we can use this principle that infants tend to look longer at things that they find relatively more surprising or unexpected. This is a, something that violates their expectation. Um, they might need more time to process that thinking like, wait, what's going on? Um, this is why you, know, you as an adult might prefer to spend more time looking at a magic trick or you might wanna see the magic trick again or in slow motion to understand what's happening. Uh, whereas if something fits their expectations, like if you saw somebody, you know, drink coffee from a mug, you don't need to see that a second time or in slow motion. So it's not very interesting and you wouldn't look very long at all. Um, so using that kind of method, we've seen that as early as uh, six months of age, infants tend to think that people who share preferences, uh, who evaluate things in the same way, are going to be more likely to be friends with each other, um, to interact positively than people who have dissimilar preferences. Mm -hmm. So talking about gossip now, of course, we as humans like gossiping a lot for some good reasons. Uh, how do children determine that a particular piece of gossip might be biased? I mean, because children just not simply believe in any kind of gossip they hear, or do they? So I got very interested in gossip in relation to some of the work on secrets, because you can kind of think of gossip as more like a secondhand secret. So um, if I hear something about somebody else that I can imagine that they don't want me to share widely, and I did, that would be gossiping. So it's sort of related to this work um, on friendship and secrecy. And there's been 
a really large and growing literature for the past couple of decades on trust. How do children decide whether to trust information that they hear? Um, this kind of trust in testimony literature is really important because most of what kids learn is from other people, from this kind of testimony and pedagogy, not from you know their own experience in the world. That would be a much harder learning problem. We instead simplify things by trusting the adults around us. Think of a classroom setting, you know, where okay, the teacher said said that, like so now I'll learn I'll learn that. So. But, you know, you have to be able to evaluate the information, like, is what they said true? How can I decide whether it's true and whether I should trust it? And so for, um, you know, a good number of years, people have been looking at these kinds of questions and found that children are able to uh, figure out that some types of information are more trustworthy than others or that some teachers are more trustworthy than others. So, for example, um, children tend to, uh, if somebody has shown that they were competent before doing these trust tasks versus incompetent, so the way that's usually shown is like that one person will label familiar items correctly, so like calling this a phone, you know, and this keys, um, and the other person will label items incorrectly, like calling this a ball, um, and this like a dog or something like that. And so then later kids are trying to learn something new. And the question is, who do they want to ask for that? And so kids, even as young as, you know, two, three years old, will say that they want to ask the person who had shown that they were competent. And so that I think is very interesting. Um, but most of the types of information that people have looked at for kids learning are these, um, you know, relatively more um, like not very social things. So like, what is this thing called? Or, you know, uh, how would I use this tool or something like that? Um, but a lot of the things that children learn and need to know in order to effectively navigate the social world are social. So like, who would be a good social partner? Who will be nice to me? who would be, you know, a good teammate for this task. And so we became really interested in whether there were differences in how kids learn these kinds of social information. Um, in particular, we used things like, you know, oh, uh, this person is good at uh, soccer or bad at reading or something. And you could use that to decide how you wanted to interact with those people in the future. And what we found was that kids understand that people are socially motivated in how they share these kinds of pieces of information. So uh, they expect friends to be more likely to say positive things about each other. So if we're friends, I'm going to be more likely to say, oh, yeah, Ricardo, he's really smart. Like he he does a great interview. Um, whereas if there's somebody I don't like, I'm going to be less likely to want to say those positive things about that person. So in addition to recognizing that people tend to be biased and socially motivated, one question is whether kids can actually use that to discount certain information. So if I really like you and you know we're having a great time and talking about this later to somebody else and I say, oh, Ricardo, he's so smart, um, you know, he does a great interview. You know, how do I how can somebody else know if they should trust that or not? And um, if people think that I'm socially motivated to say that because I like you, it might be less trustworthy than if actually for some reason um, I really didn't like you. And I still say, oh, I don't like that guy, but like he does a great interview. You know, then it seems like, oh, maybe that's more true because they have no reason to want to say it. Um, but despite my <laughs> non desire to say it, I did anyway. Um, and so we actually found that kids do show some sensitivity to that. So they're more likely to discount information that's in line with the speaker's bias. So if a friend gossips um, negatively about their friend, they think that's really believable. Um, and if somebody gossips positively about their enemy, they also find that to be more believable. So children are not really that gullible, right? I think there's a lot of research, you know, not from from my lab that children want things to be good and they want to hear positive things and all else being equal, they'll seek out this kind of positive information and maybe find positive information, you know, trustworthy. But, um, you know, when 
they're comparing different kinds of pieces of information or know about these relationships, they, they are able to make some uh, nuanced judgments about that. Um, but I, I mean, you know, in general, are kids gullible? Like, yes, probably. I mean, are adults gullible? Another kind of reason that uh, we're interested in this research is like it could have some implications for, you know, like later on in development. We study really young kids usually, but, um, you know, adolescents and young adults and adults use social media. We're getting all sorts of information that's very similar to the kinds of things we're telling people, um, you know, in terms of how do you evaluate these political actors. Um, and so how can we decide like whether the the source of that information changes how credible their statements are and so i think kids probably are relatively gullible adults probably are relatively gullible but at least we're able to make some distinctions between uh what type of information might be more trustworthy right so i would like to ask you now about one last topic slash question <clears throat> So when does participating in rituals become uh, relevant in child development? Because, I mean, rituals, I guess, are very important across all human societies. So when does that really come online, let's say? I think that rituals are the kind of thing that even infants are being socialized into, you know, not necessarily explicitly, but part of what people do in their community is rituals like and celebrations and where, you know, you try to involve all sorts of uh, people. And so, you know, basically a ritual is kind of anything that doesn't have uh, that's done, you know, to sh show that you are a member of, of the group, like, oh, we do it like this, um, and that there's not necessarily a clear causal reason for why you would do it that way. So, you know, for example, everybody in my society uses a light switch to turn a light on and off, but that's not a ritual. We all do that because we need the light to be, that's how you turn the light on. So there's like this clear connection between the action and the outcome of the action. Mm -hmm. Whereas other things um, like that are more ritualistic, there isn't necessarily a reason why you would do them that exact way other than that's how the group has decided to do it. So, um, you know, I, my, I have a daughter, she's about one and a half and she's recently become very interested in um, the, a dreidel. So we're, we're Jewish and it's like a little bit too early for Hanukkah, but she's like very interested in this dreidel and um, how her dad is very good at spinning it. I'm not so good at spinning it. Um, but, you know, it's not like an really active uh, socialization into this ritual of like, Use, using the dreidel and what how it lands would indicate different kinds of things. Um, but she really wants to be like an active participant in everything that we're doing. And we've uh, done some research that was used a very similar method to that infant looking time study where, you know, two people act like they're friends or like they're not friends. Um, but instead of comparing people who liked the same foods versus like different foods, we showed people engaging in the same ritualistic action or different ritualistic actions and found a similar pattern of results that around um, around the same age as my daughter, actually around one and a half, um, babies looked longer when people who um, engaged in the same ritual acted like they were not friends, suggesting they expect that, you know, rich, doing the same kinds of rituals might also be a good uh, cue to friendship or group membership. Mm -hmm. So, Dr. Lieberman, just before we go, would you like to tell people where they can find you and your work on the internet? Sure. Yeah. If anyone wants to know more about this, you can feel free to visit my lab website, which is just my last name. So Liberman uh, at, or sorry, dot Liberman dot psych dot UCSB dot edu. Um, I'm also on Twitter. If Twitter continues to exist, who knows if it will, um, just my <laughs> full, full name. Um, and so I'm happy to, to connect with anyone. Great. So thank you so much for taking the time to come on the show. And it's been a real pleasure to talk to you. Yeah, thank you so much. Hi, guys. Thank you for watching this interview until the end. If you like what I'm doing and to keep the channel sustainable, please consider supporting me on Patreon or PayPal. All of the links are in the description box of this interview. 
Otherwise, and if you like what I'm doing, please share it, leave a like and hit the subscription button. This show is brought to you by Enlights, learning and development done differently. Check the website at enlights.com. I would also like to give a huge thank you to my main patrons and PayPal supporters, Karen Litzke and Blanchett, Perga Larson, Lau Guerrero, Francis Ford, Hans Frederick Sunder, Ricardo Vladimiro, Craig Healy, Adam Castle, Olaf Alex, Jonathan Wiesel, Jacob Klinkby, Matthew Whittingberg, Arno Wolf, Tim Hollis, Ian Riccalenia, John Connors, Paulina Barron, Philip Force Connolly, Jerry Mueller, Herbert Gintis, Ruth Gervoz, Wo Weingard, Rebecca Neuberger, Goldstein, Dan Demetri, Robert Windegar, Rui Narcio, Arthur Coe, Zuc, Marco Neves, Colin Holbrook, Susan Pinker, Bernardo Seixas, Pablo Santurban, Simon Columbus, Jorge Pinha, Phil Cavana, Corey Clark, Mark Blythe, Roberto Inguanzo, Michael Stormir, Eric Neumann, Samuel Andreev, Tiago Nunes, Bernard Uni, Alexander Dunbauer, Fergal Cusson, Ivan Bodrin, Kuala Herzog, Don Ross, Jonathan Leibrand, Aslan Bullet, Nathan Nguyen, Stanton T, Samuel Correa, Eric Hines, Mark Smith, J.W. John Weira, Tom Hamel, David Sloan Wilson, Yasila Dez Araújo, Romain Roach, Dermito Gregoriev, Diego Londonio Correa, Tom Roth, Yannick Punter, Adana Rosmani, Charlotte Bliss, Nicole Barbaro, Adam Hunt, Pavel Ostazewski, Nelek Bach, Catherine and Patrick Tobin, Al Ortiz, Guy Madison, Gary G. Hellman, John Linares, Lida Cosmides, Saima Afzal, Adrian Gage, Nick Golden, Paulo Tolentino, João Barbosa, Jules Price, Edward Hall, Edin Bronner, Franca Bortolotti, Gabriel Pons Cortez, Ursula Litzke, Dennis Cook, Scott, Zachary Fish, Tim Duffy, Todd Shackelford, Sunny Smith and John Wiseman. My producers is our web, Jim Frank, Lucas Tafiniak, Luis Caetano, Tom Wagner, Dan Curtis Dixon, John Linares, Benedict Mueller, Vega Gidi, Sardis Francis, Thomas Trumbull, and Nuno Welder, and my executive producers, Michel Ruggieski, Rosie, James Pratt, Matthew Lavender, Sergio Codriano, and Bogdan Canivets. Thank you for all.